I don't know what you guys introduce yourselves. Okay. We'll oh, I was going to say, you just introduced me, so I can introduce myself again. Um, hello, my name is Allison Sky Richards. I am a uh, self published author of two novels on Amazon, and I should hold this closer so you can hear me. I'm actually just used to getting my voice because we don't get microphones over in the writer workshop. Um, uh, basically, the reason I'm on this panel is I have um, followed Falling Skies since the uh, pilot episode, and um, I'm a very big character writer within my um, fictional work, and Falling Skies is a very great character sci-fi series where you um, end up following more of the characters uh, beyond the plot, and that's why the show has, uh, I've all in love with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Michael R. I am a television critic for Den of Geek, and I review Falling Skies. Uh, I'm Robert Prentice, managing editor of Three of by Space. Uh, our site was uh, a dedicated fan site for Falling Skies when it began, and uh, now we cover anything sci-fi, geek, or indie. And I am Jesse Jackson, JWJ170104 on Twitter. Uh, I have nothing to do with Falling Skies, but I begged, begged, begged to be on any panel that they needed an extra voice who can talk a lot. <laughs> uh, I am a co-host of Storm in the Castle, which is a um, podcast about the Nathan Fillion Show Castle, and I've just started doing Next Stop Everywhere, a podcast about Doctor Who. Cards are available if you need it. And I'm excited to be with such a esteemed panel. I'm hoping to get a word in with Edgewise. <laughs> Thank you very much. Clearly, I am waiting over my head with these people up here. <laughs> I think the best place to start is um, with the finale being tomorrow night at 9 o'clock on TNT. Yeah. Short promo there. You're welcome, TNT. <laughs> yeah, I'm a couple episodes behind. Can we not do any spoilers? Just, just kidding. I, I actually took Thursday off. Uh, my flight was until like 2.30, and I'm like, forget packing, I've gotta make sure I see Falling Skies on the DVR, so I at least will be caught up on this panel. <laughs> okay, you one up on me, because I'm about three behind, but somehow lost, saw last week's episode. Okay. So I'm like, huh? <laughs> so I think the best place to start here is if we know we are in the second to final season at this point, I think they were approved for 10 more episodes to finish up the series next year. Where do you guys think we are so far with the series? Where is it coming? Where is it going? I mean, at this point, we, we've, we've kind of gotten to the point in season four where they have introduced us just about every twist you can possibly imagine with these aliens, and it's kind of time to start uh, revealing motives and start wrapping up some of these stories. Um, we, we still don't have a clear picture of why the H-Men are there. We have an idea that they want resources, but they, they've hinted throughout the season that there is a larger malevolent force that even the Balm um, are afraid of. And I think coming into uh, the finale here going into season five, um, that they're going to have to start to wrap that up and start to reveal some of the backstory as to the relationship between all of our alien races and what exactly they want with Earth. Because uh, it, it feels like there's a giant neon sign that says, come visit. You know? <laughs> I think we're going to the moon because that's kind of where they've been going there. I want to see, honestly, <coughs> sorry, I'm used to projecting my voice. Can you guys hear me? I don't need a microphone. Awesome. Um, I'm very interested in seeing what is going to happen um, at the finale with this going to the moon because um, they've already talked about it with the not having the, the spaceship may not have the ability to come back. Obviously, they are not going to be getting rid of Tom and Ben Mason because of them being very pivotal characters, both Tom just in general to the series, and Ben with the being the um, one of the two ties to the Ashvini race that we have had consistently since uh, the beginning of the series. So um, you know we're not going to be losing these two characters unless they really want to screw with us. Um, and also, though, with Noah Wall being the librarian, I know people were actually worried that they may be killing Tom off. Um, I don't know if you know, but Noah Wall is actually starting another series with Dean Devlin called The Librarian, based off the Librarian series. And so there was a lot of talk on Twitter when they announced about that, if they were going to actually end up killing Tom Mason off at the end of this season. So that is actually could be a concern that they may not be talking about, but I really don't think that they're going to end up killing him off. 
Um, I am still concerned with Hal's character because they have never shown any after effects still of what Tom did to him to get the bug out of him. And I have heard talk that they are still exploring what may be ramifications from that um, within his character. So I'm curious to see if they're going to go back and revisit that as well and see if that is going to bring anything into him. Because we have noticed that he's kind of gotten a lot angrier over the course of this season. And I'm curious if that is also a, an effect that's coming more from these, uh, these nano things that are inside of him as opposed to all the shit that they've put him through this poor season. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you guys. I want to see a, a good wrap up. Um, it, this has been a good series. Uh, I am not a fan that always is opposed to series ending. I think it is a natural, you should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And so I, I, when I heard that they were going to give him a final season, I took that as a hopeful, then let's, you know you're driving to an ending, you can use whatever story you have, and you can give us a nice ending to this arc of defending our world. Um, so I, I'm hoping for a good wrap up. I do want to get some of the mystery solved. And as normal, I'm one of the fans that want character resolution on top of story resolution. So that's what I'm hoping for. I think in, in, in line with that, I would love to see an Anthony storyline, personally. Yeah. Just because they whittled the way past a bit. And, and that might be partly due to budget concerns and things like that, but, but yeah, Anthony, poor Anthony. See, I had that feeling that I wanted a Tector storyline, and then you saw what happened when they gave us a Tector storyline. So yeah. be careful what you wish for with the show. <laughs> I mean, knowing it's the last season, though, I mean, it, all bets are off for a lot of characters. Um, you and know, I think I, that makes I, I, I do too. I mean, I, I honestly feel like, um, you know, the well, Game of Thrones thing here, um, they, they need to start just chopping characters, even if they're main characters. I really feel that for the series to finish out, that one of the Mason Sons is going to have to die in the last season and in a heroic way um, to kind of end the story. Um, whether that's Hal or Ben, um, I don't think that TNT is edgy enough to do Matt. Um, I don't think that they'll do Matt because they have, the writers have said specifically a lot of times that this, Matt is the viewpoint of the series for a lot of what they write. Right. Um, to have you see a lot of the world through Matt's eyes a lot of the time. So I think out of all the, the well, five now that they're married, five Masons, no, six, Lexi. So out of the six Masons that are there now, um, I think Matt is actually the safest out of all of them yeah. just because of how the writers have talked about it, unless they want to actually have the entire show die in that last episode, and then they actually would kill Matt off. And that is a complete one. possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that brings us to a very interesting question. Should the series go out with two bangs? A, a very a very big ending to the season, and use the 10 episodes of next season to lead up to an ultra finale? Or should they start wrapping up, and if they're going to kill characters off, do it over the last season? I feel like with what the aliens have done, with the infrastructure completely destroyed, with all of these deharnessed kids who who knows how long they're going to live with these spikes, we, we honestly don't know. Um, I, I don't think that there really is a happy ending per se um, oh, for some of these characters, okay. especially happy the Mason apocalypse. Yeah, uh, there's an ending. That's not very happy. Um, but I, I think that they should almost have kind of two banks. There should be, you know, first a resolution to the aliens' intentions and what they're doing, and then kind of a final resolution to some of our characters um, in, in two separate two separate entities. And I think that they should spend the first part of season five kind of wrapping up the, the, the alien mystery, since that's what we really peaked at at the end of season four, and then use the rest of the episodes in season five to wrap individual characters up, whether that's killing them or giving them background um, on some of the characters we haven't had. You know, one of the things I don't think they will do, because I'm in the minority, but I would really like to see the aftermath. I would like to see how do you go back and build the world after you're victorious? You know, how do you start the trains running again, and then more common terms, how do you get fresh water and food and everything back to a semblance of normal? Um, you know, as much as 
I would almost love a flash, a flash forward where you could see kind of after the fact where things are going and seeing uh, that might be in the span of books or something, but that would be love to see. And then um, I'm a big Sarah Carter fan from all her work in Smallville, back in, you know, Shark and everything. So I, I'm hoping she survives no matter which brother she chooses. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is an interesting topic. I love that line of Hal's last week about, um, you know, maybe she'll end up marrying Matt. Yes, I thought that was, that was that, you know, they really pushed the boundary, okay, this is just silly, but then they carried it back, and by having that line kind of, I read that as a wink to the audience that says, yeah, we know we almost went there, but we didn't, and, you know, it's okay. Fans are very passionate about that relationship. There is no gray area or middle ground. Oh, I follow, I follow that tag on Tumblr. It's like, I, I'm barely <laughs> on Tumblr, but I'm only on Tumblr for like two things. One is my Halogy, and the other is uh, Tyler Hoffman on Teen Wolf, and that's really about all I'm on Tumblr for, really. <laughs> I made the mistake of going after that that group and saying, you know, I, you know, do you really want to blame Maggie? I mean, Maggie went first. I started oh, quite the mess hate, all, the hate, <laughs> all the hate ended up on Ben. Because yes, he wasn't how yes. Maggie, so it ended up on Ben. Yeah. yeah. And and really it shouldn't have. But you know, that's yeah. that's why I feel like in season five, you know, they you've taken Ben and you rescued him, then you you built the character up where he got alienated and then now all of a sudden you've gotten everybody pissed off at him. So I feel like if anyone's not safe and who's gonna die next season, Ben seems to be the one because it, you notice with Fallen Skies, they bring him up and tear him down. Yeah. He seems to be the one that's ready to die to where everybody then feels bad. So, audience, do you guys think Ben is the most likely one? Show of hands. <laughs> well, what Mason has to die. So exactly, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. And he well, seems the most logical. Well, how yeah, many do you think it's going to be Hal? Yeah. One for Hal. One one for Hal. How many get Ben? How many, how many vote Ben goes? I got one for Ben and one for Remember, Hal. Remember, Connor isn't here, so you can vote for him and you won't find out. Oh, oh, oh. Gee, and then keep it between between you. Don't let me shoot guys now, right? <laughs> yeah, so it's got it's to it's be Maggie then. Yeah. yeah, that's bad. Eliminate the Exactly. Yeah. See, I, I think you brought a good point about the aftermath before, and that's something. There actually would have been another question of mine. Should the series pull the aftermath now, or leave that open for either a movie, a short six-season miniseries later on, books, uh, like, yeah, comic books, Dark Horse? Definitely. Well, they, it's, it's, I agree. I, I want to see, especially if they're notorious. But as we all know, it is TNT. There's a 50-50 chance out of nowhere. Earth done. <laughs> yeah, well, they could, they could also just do it in the finale of season five, towards the end, you know, sort of yeah. like a flash yeah. forward. The family road trip of the Howl, the Masons all together in the car and they go over to Cole, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. There, you know, take them all out at one time, family yeah. road trip. No, I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think that the most logical place, since the series kind of had its prequel with the Dark Horse comic, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a great place to go to kind of wrap up um, you know, the, the future forward at the end of season five, yeah. um, as you can see right there. Um, they're yeah. great comics, by the way, and if you've ever read it, that's where we got our site name from, Three of My Space. Yep, the um, two comics. This one is the prequel, <coughs> and then this is the one that takes place between season one and season two while Tom is falling on the uh, spaceship. Yes, and for those of you that know the video game that is coming out from Little Orbit, that spans the gap <coughs> between season three and four. Okay. So, just so you know, there will so be storylines. Uh, no, <laughs> you, you, you play one character, but you do get to interact with all of the main cast, and all of the voices are actually done by the actors. Ooh, yes, very nice. so um, it is uh, really neat in that way. Um, but it is a first-person shooter. But it, it's coming out in September. It'll be uh, a fun little gap if you want to really fill in the story. I think maybe we should give the audience a chance. Anybody in the audience have a question for the panel? During the entire course of the series, uh, obviously Pope and Tom have been at odds, and you know, like uh, Colin said yesterday, they're sort of two sides of the same coin. What do you think the chances are that in the finale, the two of them will work together and die in ending the invasion? Well, if you've caught up with the series, you know that uh, Pope tried to. to put his name into the hat while taking out Tom and Gabers because he wanted to be the hero. Um, he's fallen a little head over heels for Sarah, whether he will admit it or not, but he has. 
Um, but really, to be who that angry right? And who would? Right? Right. Right. To be that angry at her, he's falling. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Take it from the girl in the man. He's but I, I, don't, I don't think <laughs> it's spoiling anything to say that in the first maybe 10, 15 minutes of tomorrow's finale, um, you will see um, kind of a peak in the confrontation between Hope and Tom um, that will end in a very direct threat. Also, season five, I call Lexi gets to hit um, Pope at this point. She's yeah, the last basic child. That's right. She's the last basic child that needs to do it now. Yes. yes. Well, we actually just saw her return to the second mass. The question is, are they going to accept her? Yeah. She needs to punch Pope, though, before she, they, they, they do something. There. Well, yeah, we need the whole Mason family. I mean, we've almost got the full bingo for pump, uh, punching Pope. Seriously, <laughs> I, I demanded that gift set the second half. <laughs> I was like, I want that gift set. Yeah. <laughs> and I got it. Um, I do have to wonder what's going to happen to Pope, though, before, yeah. in the future. Right. Because what more can they do with it? I mean, you can certainly draw out his relationship with Sarah for season five. Mm -hmm. But what else? Because, like you said, I think partly when Matt hit Pope, I was kind of like, okay. Yeah. Because he, he really is a punching bag sometimes. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, at this point, aren't they used to him shooting off his mouth? Yeah. I kind of yeah. think that Pope is going to be the Horatio of this and he's going to be the one to live on the telltale. And yeah. obviously, That'd you know, right. when when you live on the telltale, it comes from your point of view, which means that the world is going to be reviewed, the, the war is going to be from Pope's point of view, which is going to be a very interesting point cool. of view to like go on to. But I really think he's the Horatio of, of Falling Skies, and he's going to be the one to live on the telltale. I don't think, uh, I honestly don't think Tom or Weaver are going to make it through the end of this. So I was going to ask about that. I, I ever since, you know, Remember the Titans, been a big Will Patton fan, but mm -hmm. I just feel like Weaver is always on borrowed time, that that's a character they just have the, the sword dangling over, <laughs> right? like, okay. <laughs> so if I'm the actor, I'm reading this, okay, yeah, made another episode. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Pope in some ways is kind of a limiter for Tom, kind of a reality check. You know, Pope is the one who's not afraid to go to Tom and say, you know what, you're, you're not thinking straight, you're out of line. I mean, Weaver was that in the first couple seasons, but I think that Weaver is siding with him so much now that Pope is the only other person there to yeah. wake him up and say, you need to really think about whether you want to trust Lexi or not, because you've seen what she did. She killed Lourdes right in your face. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that because of that, um, Pope's story will probably come to a peak early in season five with him and Tom mm -hmm. in a final conference. Yeah. So two things real quick. One, um, a quote I use in real life all the time is from the wonderful Gone But Not Forgotten Sports Night where um, they say if you're dumb, you surround yourself with smart people. If you're smart, you surround yourself with smart people who disagree with you. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, calm. And the other thing is I just want someone to say, you know, with Lexi, have you ever read any science fiction show, movie, <laughs> yeah, short story, child goes adult, never good. No, not good. Never good. But to be honest, has, I mean, Lexi probably hasn't read a single book. I mean, we see her in this whole time. I mean, you know, yeah. probably didn't have access yeah. to books, right? Yeah. She's two years old. And, you know, I'm just thinking, folks, somebody's got to say, Tom, you're a man of letters. Not to talk about another show. Oh, it seems like you should have it. See what I did there? Yes, my, other fan, my other fandom that I do not participate in, <laughs> they scare me. Um, that's why I'm not on it. Uh, <laughs> yes. But going back to the test. Yes. <laughs> but, but let's sort of put a point of From season one to season four, we admit that through the last three seasons, they've thrown every storyline they could think of, and several of them think they realize it's right there. Yeah. <laughs> Did we go too far askew from what the show was supposed to be about, or did they actually make the show what it is? I think in some respects they walked the line of going too far, but never really were pushed over that. I think the hard thing is when you go through so many showrunners and so many writers, like they did, you know, changing three separate times over the seasons. Everybody wants to get their unique touch in, and so it changes the angle of the story. You know, what made Falling Skies so unique as an alien show were the harnesses and the kids that we had in season one. That's what made it so different. And, you know, we still had that in season two, but then it disappeared. And we kind of went off um, in a very different direction. They just kind of brushed it off at the beginning of season three and went on to other things. And in season four, 
we, we kind of skip it completely. But what I love about David Icke is that he is, the, he is not afraid to be edgy. And coming into the finale, he kind of wraps us back around to some of the things from season one that we love, mm -hmm. um, which is great. And you guys will see that tomorrow. And so that has me excited for them kind of going back onto the main track for season five. So I think there were a few side stories that were probably unnecessary, but I think overall it's still what made the show what it is. Um, for me, when I walk, when I got into Falling Skies, um, you know, when you if, if you go and you try to just really watch from the pilot all the way through in a big um, chunk, just on on, on Amazon. Um, you'll notice that it is the very beginning of it, because to sell a show, you have to have that balance between plot and character. I think they realized as they were going through that people were identifying a lot with the characters, and it went from being a very plot and science heavy show to being a very character heavy show with the science starting to um, not take a second, a backseat to the story, but using the characters to drive the science as opposed to the science to driving the characters. And um, be, I, I'm, that's what kept me with the show. Um, and because um, I was kind of at the end of season one, I was actually kind of losing it a little bit. But when they came back in season two and they really started pushing a lot of the characters, especially when Tom came back and you saw how uh, the relationships had changed between the Mason brothers. You saw Matt um, starting to really grow up and not be that little kid who's just the whiny, um, getting in the way kid, but actually trying to start becoming the contributor. Um, and you saw all the character growth that happened in that, that absence. Um, it brought you back into the show looking at it differently. You're looking at it now really through the eyes of where the Masons are going as opposed to how are all these people going to survive. And you started seeing the relationships with everybody else through the Masons as opposed to through a big overall cast and how they interact with each other. And I think that felt like a shift that they took in season two that changed a lot of how you view the show. Well, there's one thing that's in season, and I, I've been a, a bit critical of season four in my reviews, but the direction I really like, which was unexpected, is the fact that it did shift from like, the political angles that we saw in season three. Mm -hmm. Kept the relationships, which we all admit is the strongest part of the show, mm -hmm. and then added this kind of mystical, flexi, which which I wasn't sure I was a fan of at first, but I, as we get closer, of course, the... Yeah. the the episode we just saw was just you know, ramping up. So I wasn't a fan of it either, but I would I say love it at the end here. It, at the end, the finale, they, they wrap it up in a really good way, and you brought up a good point about the balance of the science and the characters driving the science instead of the science driving the characters. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a lot of shows that take the science to the level of, of magic, or they take the science yeah. <clears throat> so realistic, mm -hmm. you no longer believe you're watching <clears throat> Pardon me. a post apocalyptic show. Mm -hmm. So. What I love about Fallen Skies is that it took science fiction with a little grain of fact mm -hmm. and, and put that into an alien show so that you feel somewhat grounded at the same time as you know that, yeah, it's science fiction. Whether it's a Faraday suit, whether it's um, the uh, wireless electricity, mm -hmm. all those things driven by the characters, Ding Dong this year, has been really great. You know, one of the things that if you turn off your, um, and I don't mean this in a bad way, logic or critical self, is you can enjoy the show for what it is, they've given you a lot of different flavors. We've had the, you know, we have had the, how do you do a government host, you know, when we had, you know, where Tom was involved in, the settlement and where they, you know, he actually ends up becoming president, you know, mm -hmm. so we had that political, we had the um, thing of revolutionary war fighting against an invading force. Uh, this season we had the, you know, uh, Nazi Germany, yeah. you know, where, yeah. you know, brainwashing the kids. And so it's when you think afterwards, you go, wow, this map was all yeah. over the place. But if you just enjoy what's happening, there's a lot to enjoy their spin on these different themes or tropes, you know, and how they do it in a unique way. Yeah, I, I, I have to admit, I love that, that they made Tom the history professor and they kept the history going, even though it's, 
You know, I, I you love the quotes that you have between the family where they're they're in the beginning where they're making fun of him, pulling out all the the, the history quotes and the lessons at each other. And then in season four, you have Hal leaving the message of Croatoan on the thing, where you're right. like, wow, that actually, you know, it's stuck in the family through through all of them. But you don't unless you actually know the history and how they're using the different wars to filter into the story and how they're building the world each year. You know, you don't get that un that unspoken flavor of all the history nerdism that goes into this show every season. And I'm going to be kind of curious where they're going to go for five because I think the wars that they have, the war they haven't touched yet is like Vietnam and Cold War and current stuff. So you know, I think they hammered it home with Matt arguing yeah. with his father that he wanted to be able to go into the drawing to get on the ship. Because you know he's arguing with his father, and he starts quoting history on him, and his father's yeah. like, "No, don't, don't, don't quote history to me." <laughs> well, you also have Hal arguing with Tom a lot this season mm -hmm. too, and that's also very going to become reminiscent of the Civil War, where you have brother versus brother, where you're seeing the brother versus brother with Hal and, and Ben. You're seeing father against son for that, which also speaks back to the Revolutionary War, where the sons go against the father to join the rebels to be able to change it. So you've got a lot of that going there, where they can go in different ways with that too, historical wise. Yeah. Here is a phone. I see how as his father. Mm -hmm. I see Ben. I would like to see some foreshadowing on the brother. I'd like to see maybe a connection with uh, maybe how how. Even if it's a simple Saturday day in the park, uh, could there be any insight on how she touched their lives and shaped their future? Season five, Rebecca's not dead. <laughs> there yeah, we go. Be right? yeah. We had the flashback episode in season three, which I love the backstory on that story about how they had to film that one last. Um, yeah. um, but they filmed part of it way early because of Moon's pregnancy. Well, it was Moon's pregnancy and Tom, you know, had to shave. Had to shave. <laughs> Which, you know, he's got the beard this whole season, so the only way they could do it is it had to be last because he wouldn't have been able to grow back in time. But I also love the fact that they showed that it wasn't fully a flashback, but it was actually Tom's mind because then you have to sit there and you're like, wow, you know, Maxim has aged so much in season one, just face wise. There's no way you can rewind him for that. You know, there's no way you can be aged. Well, him. and that's why I really appreciate this show how they. Use the hiatus time and fast forward the actual show. Yeah. At the same time, so yeah. Yeah. Especially for men. There's a lot of people that hated the hiatuses, but the, you know the long gaps. But in some respects, the long gaps help eliminate filler episodes for, for things yeah. and, and let you just get along with the story. I, what I loved about that flashback episode was there were little tiny hints in there of each of the actors' personal um, likes and dislikes. You know. Mm -hmm. uh, Connor, uh, as Ben, was uh, reading uh, Harry Potter, which Ben was a fan of, we learned in season one. Mm -hmm. um, but then there was another book there that was uh, manga, which Connor's a fan of. So it was just these little tiny things of both the actor's real life and what they touched on in season one that they all put into that flashback that just made it really, really great. Well, that, the, the thing you mentioned about seeing Rebecca again, it just reminded me also of this season with, with uh, Anne got the flashback to her child being taken this season mm -hmm. and how great that was where it was just so sudden and you sometimes forget that the invasion was just like here in like two seconds it was yeah and Steven Spielberg was always very specific that he never wanted a flashback to the invasion again I, I don't think that's going to change but that mm -hmm. doesn't stop them from having flashbacks uh, with direct interactions with family members especially their mother um, especially because you know we don't know 100% that she is dead I mean, they say they. He said he found her body, but at the same time, um, you know, Karen kept creeping up in every corner. Yeah. And, and it, it is science fiction. And my favorite use of Rebecca is in uh, season three, episode six, where Tom uses Rebecca to get how to fight the bug. That is my favorite use of bringing Rebecca back into the show and having um, that connection. Which you've noticed how I think it's got the most strongest connection to Rebecca of the three Mason boys. Matt is very much, you know, um, was very, well, very young as well, but Matt is very much his daddy's boy, and Ben is very much daddy's boy. Yeah. Um, but how you can see in the birth order, you know, he's going to be the one with mom. If you think about just uh, backstory-wise and where Tom is in his level of profession, 
you know, and how old they were, you know, more than likely how it was born while his Tom was still studying for his master. So Rebecca probably was with Hal a lot more oh, yeah. um, for his early development. So that forms a deeper bond with him and his mother than, you know, Ben and Matt would have had more time with dad when he was younger. So I love seeing that, um, and usually uh, how much Hal goes back to his mom, looking up at the moon, the story that he pulls out with looking at the moon, how she thought he was going to be the fire pilot. All of that keeps, it feels it keeps Hal grounded a lot more, whereas Matt, um, Tom grounds Matt in bed a lot more. And that, and, and that actually brings up, you know, because there is so much influence of their mother on them, mm -hmm. that would make an appearance by her, even if she's not really her, yeah. Uh, would really mess with the Masons come season five and could create a really interesting dynamic for them. Yeah. So TNT, you've heard that. I get another storyline as well. Yes. <laughs> Do we get commission for that? Uh, we'll have to find out. Okay. And we have another question in the back. Yes. So one of the plot, I guess, twists or decisions that I didn't like was kind of the absence of the ball after they came to her. Yeah. They spent all this build up of, of multiple episodes about they had destroyed the power plant and they had to get the grid down and then the ball came and all of a sudden the ball were gone and all they really said about it was, oh well, they we got attacked on another world and we had to abandon everything. And so it was all this build up to get the ball to come to Earth and then the entire force left except for, you know, the people yeah. And then of course go moving forward from that and having the coaches come back in. Right. But just long enough to toss a little piece of technology there. Yeah, I understand that frustration, certainly. Yeah, it is very frustrating. You know, you, you wonder is it wasn't a budget issue because of everything else that they were focusing on with the overlords for season four and everything, Lexi. Um, but I, I think once you see the finale tomorrow, um, there there is a hint of a reason for this this broader, you know, enemy that they kept talking about at the beginning of the season um, as to why the bomb disappeared. Um, and I don't think it's spoiling anything to say that We'll see the bomb return tomorrow. Am I going to be screaming in my room in the, you, in, in the uh, Hilton at 11 o'clock at night? Probably. Enjoy. Okay, but anybody the, here screaming in the Hilton, <laughs> that's me at 11 o'clock, okay? Everything's fine. So you're going to wait till the start screaming? Oh, yeah. no, I will try to keep my screaming to a minimum, but I know this show, and I know those last five minutes are always going to make me The last laugh. five minutes will make you scream, but yeah. it, it is in kind of a good way. <laughs> but to your point, I think that, be, you know, they need to, in the first part of season five, they need to explain where they went, why they went there, and, and ultimately to really, really reveal to us what is the relationship between the Balm and the Ishmeni, because we still don't have a clear picture of how these two interact and who the real enemy is, because for all we know, the Balm are still the real enemy. They're both the enemy, for all we know. I, I keep thinking the foot's the other shoe's gonna drop on Cochise. You know, because he's not with them all the time, because he's not consistent, he kind of shows up with uh, the right piece of information or the right technology. And I realize he could be a MacGuffin, but it is, I keep thinking, okay, is this the episode where, aha, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm twirling my mustache now, <laughs> foolish humans. Well, I, can we all agree though that Shaq was a pretty yes. awesome yes. addition yes. <laughs> to uh, the role? I liked having Hal had that because Hal took on kind of the leadership role that Tom had for a while there, so it seemed fitting that he got his own um, ball. Yeah. Um, and the best line he's had all season was interrupting their ritual because they can continue it after he had something important to talk to them about <laughs> during their marriage. I thought that was hilarious. But it, what, it, what it did was he did it in a very serious way when he said it, and it just highlighted the, the cultural differences so that you really realize, look, these guys are not human. They don't understand what we're doing, and yeah. we're actually working with aliens here. Well, Coach Ease is probably in the minority in terms of his that's, outlook on humans. That's why I think, you know, I don't think Coach Ease is going to turn out to be a ha-ha. Yeah. But I, I don't think that that's not a possibility for the ball as a whole. And I think he might be, yeah. you know, the guy who says, I'm against what the ball we're going to end up doing, and at some point I'm going to have to reveal that to Tom. Okay. And I think um, that may be a route that they go in season five, just from little tiny hints that they throw in the finale. Uh, with, uh, with what happens. Okay. The one thing is, is that luckily Doug Jones has job security as long as one remains of that race. Doug Jones still has his job yes, security. Yes, exactly. Since he plays all of them, so if he right. go cheese, he's still got a job, you know? Well, what's interesting is uh, <laughs> he, uh, he he plays his father and 
his and Prochi, so he's both his father and his son, which is, <laughs> that's a whole other topic we can get into, but um, the actor, the puppet actor who has done the skitters for almost all of these seasons actually is uh, Scorch. Uh, so the puppeteer who has done uh, Red Eye and a lot of the other close-ups of the skitters is actually the one who does Scorch. And then there's another actor that does the monk. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different guys that, that puppeteer those, but I think what was great with season four was that they moved to a lot of practical uh, prosthetics and not just all CGI, which is why we got a lot more screen time with the overlords. Yeah. And that's something I hope we keep in season five. So, is there any other questions from the audience so far? Yeah, I have a question about the Sith Lords. Um, yeah. There's a uh, Group on the internet is claiming that all of this is real. They're called serious. Are you guys aware of them? Uh, no. S I R I U S. Look, they're claiming that. Falling skies. Not, 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 not falling skies specifically, but if you'll trace what they're saying, it's all very similar to what you're saying. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, but we'll have to look that up. <laughs> that, that's another reason they won't do it. Not there. Yeah. <laughs> I love that there's one thing that I, I haven't understood about the series. Why give like some superpowers? It's it just does not it, it, it doesn't make sense as a whole. Whereas one child, she's two years old, she looks like she's 22, 23. And all of a sudden it's just like poof, you got Superman in falling skies. It's that's one of the things that that I haven't understood about this about the series. One of the things for when they started introducing Lexi that I thought my first thought was it was, wow, they really wanted to have a, 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 a Danny Tigerian within Falling Skies. It was the first thing I saw when I looked at her. I mean, you had the beautiful face, the long, dark hair, the, the mystical powers, this connection, you know, to an ancient race, with Earth, and this one an alien race. You know, you had all of that in there, and it felt like they were trying to pull in a character like that, um, while still using the, the trope of the, the, the child that certainly turns into an adult within it. Um, it feels like they, for me, they wanted to, um, they've been showing all these different ways of how they were, the, the bomb were using their science to change us. I mean, you see it all the way through with, 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 um, with, uh, with Jamie, um, you know, on, being cha on how they are physically changing us. But this is showing an evolutionary change by taking the DNA and changing it internally um, as opposed to, um, well, no, it's still doing the DNA on the other side too. But it's not showing them as being mutated um, types of changes because you know you get from, se from season one if they wear that harness long enough they're going to turn into a skitter they're, they're still being mutated with that change you know um, they're still not knowing what's going to happen with them with those spikes in it because you see that they if you um, look at when they take his shirt off in season four you've seen the the, um, the stuff on the back of his spikes have changed from the last time you've seen ben without a shirt on um so they keep evolving it they don't speak about it anymore but they keep evolving the makeup that is on his spikes on the back and you know they don't know what's going to happen in that which is one of the things i want them to resolve yeah. is what the end game is going to be and the effects on it, especially now that they've also injected it into maggie um, which I didn't think that was going to be possible, and that's weird how they were able to get it off of him. But yeah, I think yeah. It's, I think it's interesting when you look there. What they're trying to do is they said, okay, you know, we've explored that Ben had, can be controlled in in a sense by the overlords and by the, the skitters. They can communicate through the spikes, and so they were looking for a way to try to evolve that storyline and say, okay, we're going to try to bridge the gap. The spiked kids. Um, they're going to die off or, or mutate at some point, and they're not going to be a reliable source for us to, to continue to use. And so you got to strike a balance between trying to move that storyline forward, but as you said, not go with the same trope that other shows have gone with, with this mystical girl. Um, but at the same time, I think they, they're trying to say, okay, we, we mutated Ben and these other kids, and yes, we can manipulate them, but we can't fully control them. But if I take a child from birth 
and, and mix alien DNA with it and grow this child up that I have more control over them and can, and can use them um, to our advantage. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of it either, as you weren't, but I think as you watch the finale unfold um, and you see some of the reveals for what um, Lexi's purpose is, you kind of get an idea of where they were going. And I don't know that there was really a better way to go about it than they did. No. And I think Jamie was a foreshadow a little bit for Lexi's mm -hmm. arc too, in showing how um, even mutated and completely, basically animalistic in her way, she still recognized and protected her father in that. And I think that was also one of their subtle foreshadowings that they do with, um, with different storylines to show that this is a, a theme we're looking at as to the, the links to family and to uh, over the links of um, rearing. You know, you saw, you show that with the Nazi kids and um, are they able to be broken and or will they connect with their family and how Matt's connection with his family keeps him from being brainwashed. Whereas the girl we see ends up becoming brainwashed even though she was fighting it just as hard. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think uh, a couple of things I did appreciate about the Lexi storyline was, first of all, bringing in Karen uh, as a nod to that having been part of an ongoing plan. So at least it gave it a little bit of context. Not much, but I did appreciate that it was a Karen for that. Mm -hmm. And I also, just in the last episode that we saw, having her come in triumphantly, it, it sort of gives you a payoff for Lexi. Mm -hmm. And seeing that Ben was able to get to her with his little saying, you know, this isn't cool, this is a genocide, not, this is not the bringing of peace. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the communication through the shadow point and things like that. All those things were still fun, even though we weren't really necessarily rooting for Lexi because because of the concerns that you brought up. That was a pretty cool moment. And, yeah. and we're, we're about to get more of yes. the finale. Yeah. 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 Yes. So, and I think one of the things that is a common story point that we make is that um, we are very suspicious of paradise. Um, the quote unquote, you know, brainwashing schools where the kids are clean and they're fed and they have a place to sleep. And we immediately suspect it because they're brainwashing them. You know, that's not a good price. Uh, they, you know, Lexi has clean and everyone can, you know, it's, it's this garden in the midst of all this other chaos but we don't trust her because it, it's almost too perfect. I mean, you know, I would have been one of the people that said, oh, you can take us to a different world and we can leave this one? Yeah, let's go, guys. You know, Earth is where we make it. But no, of course, you know, they're going to stay and fight for our own world. I'm like, you know, screw it. I'm out of here. <laughs> you know? let's, yeah, we'll go make someplace else. <laughs> is, is, do I have my Springsteen CD? <laughs> okay, my Kindle, I can make it. So you're um, in Brazil. Already. That's what that's yeah, yeah, I'm gone. Brazil. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm, I convinced the E Street Band they should have gone with us <laughs> at the concerts. You know, and so I, I think that um, that's part of the reason. You know, I thought of Lexi on, um, you know, Stranger in a Strange Land, the Heinlein novel, where you know he comes back from Mars with all the powers, mm -hmm. and you're kind of building this following that is just not quite there. So I th it is a different, and that's what I kind of talked about earlier. If you take it individually, you go, well, that's out of nowhere. But if you just kind of go with the flow, you can enjoy their version of it. But I certainly understand what you're saying. And again, the context you were just talking about as far as the fighting for the homeland, you were pointing out earlier that they've covered pretty much every war Right. Up to basically the Vietnam and the Cold War. And in, in many conflicts, even in, in recent ones that we're not going to touch upon, but you know, topical things going on in the news today, we see a lot of that same thing where somebody says, Hey, uh, I got your paradise right over here, give me this land. And they're going, No, I'm okay, let's fight let's this out. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think, in very interesting context. You were asking before, the Cold War is the only thing left. In wrapping up the series, what about the possibility of neither defeat nor victory? but something where there's still constant threat. I think tons of the work. Which it seems to be is what they're hinting at with this. It does feel another like another malevolent force that's on its way. Yeah. Yeah. A giant road sign to Earth. <laughs> yeah. They just don't, they, want to, they don't want to stop going there. 
But uh, yeah, well, I mean, it, it could be kind of just left up in the air at the end. And I'm also wondering, are they going to just scrap the whole uh, Ashvedi angle? I mean, are they, are they going to still go with that? Or is that going to be, because we're assuming, of course, that this is going to the moon thing. We're hoping for a happy yeah. ending, right? That they're going yeah. to be successful. But that, surely that will take away the entire Shvetty. Because I'm not hoping for the happy ending because it provides more storylines. I'm wondering if, this, if they're still going to have some fight in them. Well, I mean, you also had Cam's warning at the end of season, um, at the end of season three as well, about you have no idea what's coming in that. And it's not just the threat against the bomb, but, you know, it's Karen may, may have been trying to warn them about things even beyond that that they never got to hear. And so there is the option that the Vama know a lot more about what's out in, in, in the outer space than, than they've ever let on. And, you know, they, you know, you have that moment where Coach Hughes' father had, you know, wanted to, to send him a nice place. So technically, you know, that group is not as trustworthy as they originally thought. You know, you know what's going to say that, you know, not only is whatever the bomb are afraid of coming down as well, but what's to say that there's not a force behind that force as well? You know, there's can continue going on with that forever. I also heard in an interview, I think it was with Doug Jones, mm -hmm. that there's a reason why Earth was chosen. Yeah. There's something specific about Earth that they need. Do we know? Because I don't think we actually know the answer. Sort of. Tomorrow we, we, will, we will determine. It's feels, that's what it is. Yeah, we will, we, will determine, <laughs> we will determine some of it. I think um, Scorch also hinted at it in the second or third episode when Tom was on the dirigible that, um, that there was a bigger, larger force out there that we're not aware of. And I, yeah. So I think in some respects, um, you know, they, the Ishveni, I don't know that will ever go away because they still have all of the, the, the enslaved race of skitters that they've had for so long. So, you know, let's say that they're successful at, at you know, the power poor thing. Um, you know, the Ishveni was still a risk before the power poor was even a thought. Mm -hmm. And, you know, David Ike just at Comic-Con commented, he said, while the finale will give you kind of a nice wrap up to the season, it's one hell of a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, screaming, we live in closet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Questions again? I agree with with these two right here, what makes us think that even if they blow up the core on the moon there, what's to stop the Ishveni from coming and just rebuilding the core? I mean, they rebuilt the Death Star. Well, also, <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, a, that's a good example. Remember, yeah. though, that, I mean, I, I don't know if, if you guys felt the same trepidation in the season premiere as I did with these big, giant green things came down and shot up the little electric fences. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Well, yeah. Why didn't they use these before? before yeah, where, where did but, that come from? But yeah. if you see yeah. that it's tied into the power thing, yeah, right. and if that's new, then now I'm kind of... You do realize that. I just understand. They had the whole weapon that could take the, that could take the, the, the aircraft out of the skies. Why didn't they just shoot the shoot the, uh, the fences? Especially where, where, where they were coming down. If you would have you could have gone away that way, that that, 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 that sort of... <laughs> And if the bone had to, had to leave, why didn't they leave a big, nice, well, and I, of weapons? Right? I think, I think you know, when the bone left, they took a lot of their weaponry with them. Obviously, yeah. um, they were a little miffed at Thomas <coughs> standing up to to Coach's father. I think, in some respects, um, we did see Tom use one of those bone modified weapons to start shooting the Mega Max, um, but then uh, a bomb landed next to him, and he was knocked out, and he lost the weapon out of his hand. And stepped on by one of the Mega Max. So, you know, I, I, it was being used. Um, I, you know, common sense would be that we would shoot the big pylons coming down first rather than the Mega Mech. But, you know, in the heat of the moment, people do stupid things. Um, I think in some respects, it's a little bit like the magic bullets that we had in season one, where how can you take this mech metal that is supposedly impenetrable and just take, you know, a regular burner and melt it down into, into bullets, <laughs> and wow, now all of a sudden I can pierce mechs. I mean, you know, it was maybe a little bit of lazy writing, um, and I think that they were trying to fast forward a little bit and say, okay, we don't want to really get into this long, drawn-out thing about why they had the lack of weapons that the Vulm once gave them. So they showed that brief moment with Tom, and then they moved on. Um, but, you know, I, I do get the, what you mean by the sense of, you know, why weren't they using more of those weapons? And I think a lot of it is that the untold thing uh, behind the scenes is that the Vulm took off with the majority of them. Um, and you see them go with Cochise to a, a weapons cache, which, again, gets destroyed, <laughs> as, okay. is, as is with Falling Skies all the time. But I think that's why they didn't really have those weapons. 
My one big concern is what they're going to do to get rid of that power source because here's where science comes to be fun. What happens when you blow up a part of our moon? What happens to Earth at that point? Because your moon is kind of responsible for your lunar cycles, your tides, to be you know, all that stuff. <laughs> if our moon gets blown up, what happens to the planets? I will say, I will say <laughs> the movie about Michael Bay. <laughs> David Icke uh, with Kevin Grazer, they, they love to really dig into real science, put that little grain in there, and then expand the science fiction. I think you will find that um, the real science in it is actually very cool um, and very interesting, but um, to be continued. <laughs> Again, 11 p.m. screaming at Sunday. Yes. yes. <laughs> Any other questions from the article? There we go. Oh, yay. Oh, no, you're trying to tell me to hurry up. Oh, <laughs> I, I thought I was getting a 10. I thought I was going to be like, yeah, I was going to get a 10. Yeah. 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 Speaking yeah. of 10s, yeah. 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 you're waiting your screening for tomorrow. It's 11 at screening. Uh, if you uh, go to the app and rate the panel, if you loved us, please say nice things. If you didn't, come tell us in person why you didn't like us. And then still have to say nice things on the app. Yes, yes because that way we can continue to have Falling Sky stuff at DragonCon, too. Because yes. I love talking about my favorite show. Being that you're in the final 10 minutes, and no further questions at the moment, I think the best way to go from here is how should the series wrap up, and not so much we already discussed, close the storylines, who needs to die, or who will die instead. <laughs> <laughs> but really, should it end with victory, or should it end with defeat? Which way should they go here? Because it is TNT, and we, we all know this, so far we got to porch trying to figure it out themselves. <laughs> I think the defeat is going to come in the form of uh, the downfall of some people's lives. Yeah. You know, people dying. Whereas I think the human, human race in general is going to probably, I, I think they should prevail, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I'm, maybe I'm looking for punishment, but you know, I would like to think that there would be you know, a never-ending conflict that could go on in, in comics. Um, but I would say that it would be a mix of, um, they would be successful overall as far as, you know, the, the more global threat, but that, you know, the aliens aren't completely gone and that they're going to constantly be living day by day, watching out for when the aliens might come back. Mm -hmm. um, I think we may, we should lose some main characters, and I'm talking like Mason level main characters in season mm -hmm. five, um, to really push the impact home. Uh, but I think that it should, in some ways, be left that, okay, the alien threat is not completely gone, and there's still a fight to be had, because some of these people, including Tom at this point, their whole purpose is fighting, you know, especially uh, Ben. Um, I, I can't imagine Hal or Ben going back and having a married life and just, you know, sitting around having kids, you know, they're, they're so in, entrenched in being in that fighting mode now, I don't think they could ever leave it. So I think in some respects they should leave that kind of open-ended. Um, I grew up on Disney movies, so I'm looking for a happy ending. Um, and I do think uh, humans will be victorious. I think it'll be at a pretty uh, huge cost. Um, I've already been very vocal about wanting to see a little bit of the aftermath. Uh, and seeing how things go. I hope uh, we get at least one happy couple out of it, and I will be happy whichever one it is and be sad about the ones that don't work out. <laughs> uh, and, um, and you know, you've got to have, um, I wouldn't mind if somehow uh, Lexi became a baby again. I don't know how you put that baby back to the bottle, but, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that out. Yes, but, uh, hey, it's magic. And so, still young, we'll just have another one. Yeah, or Tom lives. Or, or we could go the really left field route, and they all wake up and it's a dream. No. Uh, the snow globe, the snow globe. Yes, I had to go there. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, I hope they don't go there. Yeah. Um, yeah, please, please get to whatever you do. No, no, no. Um, I, 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 I kind of go along with when I think about where I want to go. I always go back to Maggie's line about how she can't, she won't be able to settle down and in, into that life that she had, and that she's always going to be looking for that next fight. And I think that even if they do get victorious over the the aliens, and it's the humans have their planet back. 
Um, I don't see that that's going to end up the fight. I mean, you've looked at shows like um, other shows like Revolution and, and such, where there's infighting then among the humans. We even had it in our own uh, in the end of season two, you know, yeah. with with that. So even if the aliens are defeated, you're going to have such a big regrowth period where there's going to be a lot of infighting with amongst the ones that remain. History still really willing to be written at that point because again, if Pope is the Horatio, you know, you have. Pope telling the story, and Pope will have power to be able to to push the story where he wants it to go. You know, you're going to have whatever Masons survive with their story to continue on. I think the Masons and Pope are always going to be against each other, and some respect for that. And that just shows the continue of a civil war that could go just between the humans and itself. Um, I really would love to see it continue on into comics. I don't think that. Um, for me, having it continue into a movie, um, kind of like Serenity did, I don't think you can do that because then that creates another point of an ending, right. where it has to have an ending, whereas comics can continue on and storylines can continue to be made until it shows that there's no one really there watching. But I think as long as we have that fan base to show to bring it in, you'll get to continue to see the stories continue on with the characters, the new characters being introduced a chance for 20 years down the line, a new alien race coming down, all the Mason children have to pick up where their parents left off. You have all those options open in a comic to continue on for it, but I don't see that it's, even if they end up defeating the bomb uh, and whatever force is coming in, that it's gonna leave them safe into having a very nice, happy rebuild. There's gonna still always be infighting as they go through that reconstruction phase. Yeah, and they can use the comics too to even uh, explore the pre-invasion um, that Spielberg didn't want to, uh, if there was an audience for that. But definitely the comics, you could go very, very many side routes. I want that season. That's I want the stuff between season two and season three still, where you have you know how recovering from the yeah. beginning of the bug, Tom's rise to becoming president. You know yep. all those power changes that happen in just between two and three that we never got to see. I want those Denny stories. Story. Yeah, I mean, I want those stories still. I was hoping that there was going to be a comic coming out like the Battle of Finchburg did yeah. to, to explain all of that because that is a big character development on both of the Masons that we never got to see at all. We just saw how they got there. Exactly. Yeah. Any other audience comments or questions in our final two minutes? One minute. One minute, thank that. I think um, the one that I'd like to see, we all know Assuming Earth is victorious, and, and we'll look at the S here. Earth wins as humans rule. There we go. But, but we, we do know this. We know what Pope is. We know probably what Pope used to be. Let's take Pope as our Horatio, for instance. Mm -hmm. What does Pope become five years after victory? I think that, they if they were a chef. I, I can almost <laughs> be, he's going to be a chef. About that. Because, right. you know, he's, he's yeah. really keen on cooking. Yep. Yes. I'm telling you right now. Tom coming down and dinner with his family, and he's the head chef. That would so, be hilarious. You know, uh, in the um, the last Rocky movie, right? He owns a restaurant, and he comes and tells stories about the old days. That's Pope. That's Pope. Pope. <laughs> he owns a restaurant. And he talks about the old days. That's that's how it ends. Let me tell you about these goddamn masons. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end, five years later, Pope running a restaurant in Charleston. <laughs> exactly. Well, that does, it, that does it for us. I want to thank you all for joining us, our panelists. Thank you very much for your insights. Thank you. And uh, feel free to join us for our future panels and the rest of the day. And enjoy your convention.